Thanks, Steve, for joining me. I'm really excited to talk with you today. I wanted to have a quick Q&A with you just to talk about some research, research recently that validates polygenic risk scores in embryo screening, or what is known in the IVF world as PGTP. And you recently wrote a blog post on this. So I'd love to kind of dive into that and I'll put a link in the comments so that people can find what I'm talking about. But why don't we start off with you kind of summarizing this new research and what it's all about? Great. Hey, it's great to be with you today, Elizabeth. Um, you know, the blog post might be a little bit technical for the average reader, although I think for an IVF physician or genetic counselor, it, it is a reasonably uh, clear read. And I encourage anybody who's you know, really interested in this topic to go and look at it because it cites not just the two papers that we're focused on here today, but lots of other research that's relevant that's in the literature. And so it's, it's, it's a good source for background on this. So what do these um, papers in depth talk about? Right. So these are two new papers that came out just recently. They're both by collaborations. Each paper is a collaboration of multiple well-known researchers, people that are well-known in the field of genomics. Um, I refer to one of them as Carmi et al., and the senior, I believe the senior author on that paper is Shai Karmi, who's a um, statistical geneticist in Israel. And if you're on Twitter, you realize Shai is a guy who follows the literature, the new preprints, um, the new papers that come out very carefully, and he tweets about them. He's a great source for following what people are doing because he, he tracks everything. But this is new research that he and his group did, which is really good. The other paper, um, the first author is a guy called Patrick Turley, but the, in some sense, senior author, at least the most famous guy to my knowledge, in, uh, who's the co-author of the paper, is a guy called Peter Vischer, who's a kind of legend in um, computational genomics, and he's based in Australia. So, But I'll, just for shorthand, I'll refer to them as Carmi et al. and Vischer et al., so just two papers that came out recently. And the uh, and I should say that the Vischer et al. papers published in the New, New England Journal of Medicine, which is, you know, kind of a very prestigious journal. And it's also a sort of special review article talking about PGTP in IVF. And what's exciting to me about these two papers is that they are, from our perspective at GP or in my research lab, they are validating or replicating results that we published ourselves in the last couple of years. And so for people who are not actual research scientists, the idea is the way science progresses is that you have different independent labs or different independent collaborations of researchers trying to figure out how, how does nature work? How does this technology work? Um, what are, you know, how well does PGTP work? <clears throat> and what's great about it is that, you know, we do our best, we publish our results. You know, some of our papers, like 50, if you include the supplement, they're like 50 pages long with all kinds of graphs and computer calculations done on the Michigan State supercomputer. So, you know, it's, it's pretty daunting stuff. And it's great that other groups weighed in to try it their way and then compare their results to our results. And that way you can rely more and more as, as the results have been replicated by more and more independent groups, the more confident you are that, yeah, this is really the characterization of how nature works. And so in the Carmi et al. paper and in the Vischer et al. paper, they look at the ability of polygenic risk scores. So PG, what in the industry you would call PGTP. So it's a computer calculation given the genotype, given the specific DNA variants that an individual embryo has, how much can we reduce risk of certain diseases if we select the embryo with, for example, the lowest score? So, a typical situation, which um, I refer to as the embryo choice problem, um, it sounds like a very fancy term, but that's how that's how we scientists think. It's like you define some problem and uh, then we try to solve it. So imagine you're confronted with the situation where you're an IVF family, you've been lucky enough to have maybe some number, it could be four or five, or maybe it's just two viable embryos, but you have to pick one to prioritize for transfer. And that's a, that's a real situation because more often than not, they do have to make some decision about the first embryo to transfer. And so it's a real life decision, super important, um, agonizing maybe for couples. And the question is, if we have really precise genetic information, a genotype for each embryo, 
what is the best we can do in advising the parents in how to select and to what degree can we reduce the risk of really impactful disease conditions like schizophrenia or type 2 diabetes. And so these are, this question is analyzed in both of these papers. They do extensive computer calculations. So they, they've developed a method for taking a mom's genotype and a dad's genotype and scrambling them together in a realistic way, scrambling them together the way that would actually happen in nature when you make a sperm and an egg. So they basically built that into their computer simulations. And then they basically generate um, you know, sets of embryos as if they had been produced in an IVF cycle. And then they test if we calculate the PGTP score or the PRS score for the embryos. And for example, if I follow the rule of always select the lowest risk one for type two diabetes, at the end of the day, how much have I reduced the risk that later in life that child will have type two diabetes? And, you know, tons of calculations in these papers, lots of math. Um, but the, the, the summary result I would give is that the results are very consistent with the results that we had obtained in the past, I guess, couple of years. And in our case, we didn't simulate the data. We actually had access to tens of thousands of siblings. So kids that had actually grown up in the same family, had lived through adulthood and were typically late in life, like 50 to 70. So we knew who had the condition and who didn't, and we could test our algorithms to see whether, you know, if there are two brothers and one has diabetes and one doesn't, how well would our algorithm have done in picking out which of those two was lower risk for diabetes? And what's interesting is we used real empirical data. They used very complicated computer simulations, but all the results are pretty consistent with each other. Wow, that's incredible. And so getting back to this um, with PGTP, just for people who aren't familiar. So as you noted, um, if people are going through the IVF cycle and they're trying to pick an embryo to put back, you know, years and years ago, the test was which one looks good, right? And it was just based on shape. We call it like in, you know, layman's terms, the beauty pageant, right? Which one of these is the prettiest embryo to go back? And so now effectively, we have the ability to look and see which is the prettiest genetically, right? Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. So the way I would describe it is in the past, the embryologist or whoever was watching the process of the embryo's development would say, oh, I really got a feeling about this one. This one looks really good to me. It's very symmetrical. I like the shape of the little cells. They, they look really cute. Um, and if you think about it, it's like, well, maybe that guy, that that man or woman who's the embryologist or whoever makes the selection has some special gut intuition for picking out the best embryo, but surely that could be improved on. And maybe if you're, you know, on average at a clinic, maybe that particular embryologist isn't a great whiz at picking your child based on the appearance of some little round cells, right? So maybe you don't want to go with that. And, you know, as you know, Elizabeth, what's become much more common is to at least test for chromosomal abnormality. That's very common. And that same biopsy that's used to do that, what's called PGTA or PGT aneuploidy testing, the same biopsy is what genomic prediction uses to then further uh, calculate the genotype, measure the genotype with high precision, and then calculate these risk scores. So we're not introducing any extra action at the, at the biopsy point. It's the same biopsy that's already commonly done in, say, about half of US uh, IVF cycles. Um, but we're just deducing much more information about uh, the risks that each embryo would face were it to become a child. Um, and what's nice is now that you have these two other very powerful research groups that have done the calculation and are getting similar results. Wow, that's so interesting. And so what can you tell IVF practitioners or you know parents who are looking to go through IVF and want to learn more about the current status of PGTP um, where are we in all of this? I know it's already being done. Um, so tell me a little more about that. So, you know, just to take a step back, you know, 
Um, if you're a family going through IVF, obviously you're super interested. You have to pick the clinic you're going to work with. You have to make some decisions along the process about how you're going to handle things. And ultimately you may have to select an embryo. And obviously there's just incredible amount of information overload. You're maybe stressed out. It's, it's a difficult situation. You know, everybody's really just hoping that we, you know, we can have a child. So it's a difficult situation for the parents. And then let's think about it from the viewpoint of the lab staff and the IVF doctor. They're dealing with lots of patients. Some of the counseling they do with patients is more on an emotional level. It's not necessarily trying to teach them all of a sudden teach them a course in genetics or something. Um, so everybody's got a lot on their hands. And so now add to that this whole new field where because of advances in genomics, we have my lab will routinely analyze a set of like a million genomes. Like we might have a million genomes in our supercomputer and we know which of these people in that set of a million people had diabetes or had breast cancer. And we're applying, on top of that, we're applying what's called machine learning or AI to figure out which are the specific places in the DNA, in your DNA that are predisposing you a little more or making you a little bit less risk at risk for breast cancer. It's a really complicated scientific thing. And even an IVF doctor isn't necessarily an expert on that. Like how many IVF doctors know what goes on at a supercomputing center, know how precision genotyping is done, know how AI algorithms work. So it's all great because you have all these different frontiers in science that are advancing at the same time to the benefit of the families, but you can't expect everybody to understand every aspect of it. I certainly don't understand all the medical aspects of IVF. I you know, stick to my little area, which is you know AI um, and big data. Um, and so I think if Obviously, they should seek out places where they can get, you know, the explanation at whatever best level is, is, is best, for, whatever level is best for their comprehension, they should seek it out. Our company, Genomic Prediction, excellent communicators like you, Elizabeth, are there to help them figure out, like, if you want to read the, the original scientific papers, hey, go to my blog post, click a link, you got it. You can read through 50 pages of mathematics and computer results and things that have been peer reviewed by other scientists. You can read that or you can read a more, you can, on the other end of the spectrum, you can watch a three minute video, which is a cartoon, which genomic prediction has prepared and will explain at a, I think a more accessible level, all of this stuff. So everything is available to you, uh, the company and all the scientists who wrote these two papers that we're discussing. Everybody here is to here to improve this whole practice and also to make it accessible to uh, individual parents and doctors. And add to that, right, there's um, also genetic counseling. So once people decide, right, that they wanna go through this, there's an expert there. I was fascinated when genetic counseling um, and genetic counselors came along because they didn't exist back when I was born. Yeah. Um, right, And now they can't train enough of them. Yeah, as a profession, that's, that's their whole, um, job is to really walk people through this whole process and look at the history, look at the whole big picture, right? Right. Um, so, you know, when I said IVF professionals, I should have said it more explicitly like you did, but I didn't mean just the doctors and the embryologists. I meant also the genetic counselors. And of course, the genetic counselors that have experience working with GP, with genomic prediction and life view, you might be a genetic counselor at a clinic that's thinking about starting to use PGTP. And of course, you have a learning curve too that uh, you would like to climb. And, you know, obviously we're here for that as well. So, um, you know, I think, Elizabeth, you and I, one of the reasons we believe so much in this comp our company and these technologies, because ultimately they're helping people. They're helping people have healthy babies and they're helping those babies grow up to have, you know, long um, you know, productive lives. And that, that's the ultimate goal. And so anything we can do to help any of those people, families, genetic counselors, embryologists, physicians, you name it, we're, we're here for that. Right. And I think one of the very interesting things about this whole technology is that um, from a very inside baseball perspective that I happen to have, and I've gone to infertility conferences since I was eight years old and, you know, had doctors lecture me on, I shouldn't wait to have children and all of these things. Um, 
you know, for me, it's very, very interesting um, when all of the ethical discussions come up because 40 years ago when I was born, um, it was called Playing God. It was Designer Babies. Um, and, you know, people really didn't understand the technology and therefore would make assumptions and be scared of it. And so for me, it's always been a, a personal crusade to really kind of pull back the curtain and look at all of this. And, and um, I think one of the most fascinating things is that um, the industry is growing at the same time that the public is learning. And so for the first time ever, it's kind of like the public can see how things are evolving when it used to all just be behind closed doors. So can you talk a little bit about, you know, when people talk about, well, what are the ethics of PGTP? What are the ethics of all of this stuff surrounding IVF? What do you feel on, on those topics? Yeah, there's, there's really a lot to say. So if you'll, if you'll bear with me there, I want to hit a couple of different points. So number one, I've always felt, and I think genomic prediction, the company has always felt that a wide conversation, hopefully well-informed by the fundamental science. So, so the real advancement in these papers is further validating the fundamental science about PGTP. But once you are aware of the fundamental science, then I think everyone is entitled to an opinion because I can't tell you what your ethics should be. You can't tell me. So there should be this society-wide conversation about, okay, what are the appropriate things that one could screen for or could enter into the embryo, cho embryo choice decision? And what are things that we're not so comfortable or we need to think about more before they enter into the conversation? And I think that's a totally legitimate thing that should happen, it will happen, but the first step is to, is to get the science down really firmly and then we can talk to each other on, from, the same, you know, from the same foundation. Now, these papers um, are a mix of, you know, it's kind of funny, you read the, paper, the two papers that we're talking about, it's a mix between, okay, these are these hardcore scientific results, the result of computations and simulations, and then like, then there might be some ethical advice for like, well, we, we recommend this or we recommend that. And I think every one of these opinions is justified. People, people can advocate whichever position they want, more regulation of this, less regulation of this. We as a society have to reach some you know, equilibrium or some you know, agreement on, on how it should be done. The thing I want people to keep in mind, and this is the thing which I think you uniquely understand of everybody on the planet, or maybe the handful of other people understand as well as you, is that in the early days of IVF, and this is true for any technological breakthrough in medicine or even beyond medicine, like it could be, we could be talking about nuclear weapons or AI, any really powerful technology is going to raise a lot of ethical issues because it's gonna potentially impact human civilization in lots of ways. And we should have that conversation. But what people don't realize now, because in any medium-sized city in the US or even the world, I can look in the phone book or I search on Google and I can find an IVF clinic and just go there and have a consultation, right? That's, that's, a, that's the reality we live in now. Right. When you were born, you know, the first IVF baby in the United States, the situation was completely unsettled, right? It was borderline, I think, Ill I, you know this better than me, but illegal in some states to perform IVF. It was illegal. Actually, I'm from, from Massachusetts and my parents had to go to Virginia and it was illegal in Massachusetts. So I was actually born in Virginia. Right. Right. So you had to cross state lines to... <laughs> <laughs> to be created. So, so people don't realize the pressure and the unpleasantness that the original pioneers, your parents, the doctors who performed the procedure, the scientists who developed the technologies, they were called terrible things in those days. I remember, uh, not to introduce my history into this, but I remember in the I think it was in the 80s, maybe the 70s or 80s, I forgot the exact year. I was sitting at breakfast, I remember this very distinctly, I was sitting at breakfast with my mom and dad, and I think Dan Rather or some CBS News person came on and announced, maybe announced you. I don't know if it was you or announced Louise Brown, the first, the UK born um, uh, IVF baby who preceded you. But um, they announced it as, you know, first test tube baby. And it really stood out in my mind as like, wow, this is a new era of, you know, science. But then immediately people started calling the doctors who did this 
Frankenstein doctors, you know, potentially murderers, all, all kinds of crazy things that to us now, looking back, seem totally insane. And I'm pretty sure that, you know, I think a few, at least a few percent of all babies in the U.S. are born through IVF now. In Denmark, it's 10 percent. So if you go down to the local kindergarten and you one thing that I always come back to with everything it's such a personal decision when you're going through trying to plan a family it's inherently this extremely personal thing and so yes you can have all of the best information in the world um, and all of the cutting to edge, edge technology um, but ultimately it's your decision right and and so that's I think what we all strive for is just as a as a journalist you know i want to make sure people have all of the information before they make a decision because if you're missing one piece or one element you're not really informed enough to make a decision on what you'd like um and so for me it's always you know i was taught at age five the elevator speech on how i was born and to this day that's still how i explain it so i'm i'm hoping that when it comes to PGTP and, and other technologies out there that we all can get to a point where the elevator speech just rolls off our tongues and it becomes very easy to understand and explain. I think if I had to summarize the impact of these two new papers combined with all the work that we and other groups have done on this, I, I would just say the following. If you have the genotype information, if you go to the trouble of getting the genotype information of the embryos, you can make a better decision. You can end up with a healthier child than you otherwise would have. And that's a powerful, you know, capability. I fully respect any family or any IVF clinic that says, no, it's not for us. We're going to wait. It's too early. Uh, you know, it's too controversial for me. I respect that opinion. But on the other hand, I really think in the long run, there's no doubt this will become standard of care. This will become just something totally unremarkable um, that, oh, yes, well, we, we checked the embryos for, you know, genetic issues and da, 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 da. And, we, and number one, number four was the one that we prioritized for transfer. And I think people won't even think about it, you know, five or 10 years from now. I think it's all so fascinating and I really appreciate you chatting with me today, Steve, and I look forward to chatting again soon. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, one final comment is that, you know, we live, uh, the other contrast between now and when you were born is that we live in the internet information age. So if you want to learn more about this, you don't have to start with my blog post, but there are many sources. You could start with the Genomic Prediction or LifeView website. But there are many places where, you, again, you can get the information at multiple different levels. Whatever is appropriate for your background, you can understand what PGTP is um, just your couple mouse clicks away. Or even and you can be on your phone in a couple clicks and you can be watching a video of describing how this all works. So I encourage people, anybody that has questions about this or, you know, um, that that is what you should do. You should educate yourself. And, um, you know, your opinion is as valid as anybody else's. Exactly. Well, thanks so much, Steve. Thank you. All right.